Welcome to Men Making a Difference, PGSAO Men Who Inspire and Motivate. Hello, John Naylor. Thank you so much for joining me today. Good afternoon. Nice to uh, be with you this afternoon, Ms. Birdboy. Thank you very much. You know, oftentimes the community gets to hear from me as the elected state's attorney, but you're doing some incredible work here in the office and you have recently been promoted to the assistant chief of our major crimes unit. So I would like you to talk to everyone about uh, the role of major crimes uh, in our office, your unit in our office, and also, you know, what type of cases you all handle and, uh, and the impact of the work that you do. All right, so the Major Crimes Unit is a team of, uh, of 12 people, a chief and assistant chief, which is the role that I occupy. Um, and then we have three community prosecutors and seven line attorneys. Um, our office is kind of the primary felony prosecution unit in the office. Um, we handle what you would consider to be kind of your run-of-the-mill felonies, everything from attempted murders to burglaries and car thefts. Um, robberies, uh, armed robberies, assaults, serious assaults. Um, so all of those come through our unit. <clears throat> it adds up to about 1,200 cases a year that our unit will process um, from the time it's indicted through to a final resolution. Um, one attorney will, hopefully one attorney will be assigned to the case and handle it the whole way through. Yeah, absolutely. So, so why don't you talk about that? Because, you know, the cases can uh, really run the gamut it, it, up to and including attempted murder, um, which is very, very serious. And the, the difference between a case coming to your unit and a case uh, going to homicide is, is really not whether the victim survives. So can you talk about kind of the, the, the serious nature of those cases and how you work with victims uh, of these crimes? Yeah, and so that's the, the big thing with major crimes is all of our uh, offenses are victim-based felonies. So they're going to be felonies that are have a victim um, who we have to work with um, and sometimes uh, encourage uh, to work with us uh, through the process. So we will, you know, attempted murders, assaults, burglaries, all of those things have a, a person who was affected and, you know, they generally start with a 911 call going into the police uh, from a person who's currently involved in a crisis situation they've been shot at or their home is being broken into or their car, they woke up in the morning and their car is missing. So, and then the police respond, they begin the investigation and then they present those findings to our office. From that point, we handle the prosecution side of the case. So we will take the court side of the, the case um, and we have an obligation to represent the state in the courtroom, um, but that also means that we have an obligation to uh, represent the interests of the victims. So we have to work closely with our victims. We got to, you know, our attorneys are trained to have victim uh, meetings where they either through the telephone or in person in the office will have meetings with the victims in order to discuss what the process of a criminal prosecution looks like as well as the the um as so the process of criminal prosecution as well as what we think the case has in terms of its merits and and challenges as we proceed through the process so yeah and let's talk about sometimes some of those challenges sometimes the, the challenges may be uh, the evidence that we have and how the evidence was collected. So can you talk about uh, also our role in protecting the constitutional rights of defendants in the system as well? So uh, yeah, um, we, we, as, we have an obligation to present the best case that we can present, but sometimes the best case that we can present isn't that good. And it's not uh, through anyone's fault or, or you know, due to any deficiencies you know, unfortunately at this point um, with how rapidly technology has improved and how many, how much resources it takes to do a full and complete investigation that's just not reasonable to occur in every single case. And so, you know, as, as a county, we, you know, there's a, 
like I said, our, my unit will handle about 1,200 cases a year. Um, we have, I think, six DNA analysts. I think we have three fingerprint analysts in the county. And so when we present these cases for trial, oftentimes people want to know what the DNA evidence is and what the fingerprint evidence is. Um, and we may not be able to present that to them because it just doesn't exist. It wasn't preserved or it wasn't collected or it's not collectible. Um, and so those will have an impact on how we present the case and, and move forward. Now, you know, we, we still, if a case is strong without that, and oftentimes there's a good case still, I mean, there's eyewitnesses and there's, now we have cell phone evidence and, and all these types of things. So we, oftentimes we still have a good case that we can put forward, um, but it sometimes can be very challenging. And so, you know, if, if we review a case and it doesn't look like we're going to be able to make the elements in court, then we have to have a very difficult conversation with our victims um, where we have to tell them that we don't think we can proceed with those cases. Um, and, and those cases will often end up being dropped. Um, or sometimes it'll be that, you know, we have a good case for, you know, some low level offense like a theft. So we know that the person had the stolen property in their possession, mm -hmm. but we can't prove that they were the one who broke into the home. So instead of doing a burglary uh, case, we're offering a theft charge. Um, so that that's kind of how it goes. Yeah, absolutely. And I kind of want you to also talk about a little bit about sort of the, the as we go through and we evaluate cases, we also are looking at, you know, Fourth Amendment rights, Fifth Amendment rights, the rights of defendants, and 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 really, we, we protect the justice system as a whole. You know, certainly we advocate and we want to get justice for our victims, but we cannot do that um, at the expense of you know constitutional rights and other rights that folks have. So, can you talk about like what our role is in evaluating that, and then how we uh, address those issues when they do come up? Right. So um, mostly those come up in our screening process because we, you know, all of us being attorneys are trained in the Fourth Amendment and in the Fifth Amendment. And we can spot issues and identify them. And so when we screen the case, if we notice that there was an illegal stop, search or seizure that was conducted by the police, then obviously we wouldn't move forward with that case. We wouldn't indict it. It wouldn't end up in our circuit court. Um, to, to the extent that it's th that we can now we hopefully and that in my personal practice I don't just leave it at that I try to educate the person who made the stop search or seizure at issue or obtain the confession at issue um, which is causing a problem legally so that they understand why they aren't allowed to do that um, so teach them about probable cause and, and things like that Uh, absolutely. And so, so John, you, you've tried a lot of cases. Uh, you've been an attorney for a little while. Can you tell us about one of your um, uh, most challenging cases? So the, the most challenging cases that I've handled personally are, are probably DUI homicide cases. Um, I specifically remember the first DUI homicide that I was assigned to um, was a, a pretty sad case. It wasn't in Prince George's County, but um, it involved a, 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 per, a vi the victim in the crime was a retired state trooper. He had spent, you know, 26 years of his life uh, really trying to prevent people from driving under, in an impaired or intoxicated condition. You know, he worked on DUI task force and things like that. Um, after he retired, he, he, uh, bought a blacksmith shop over on the Eastern shore and he was doing a second career as a blacksmith and he was asleep in his shop one night when two guys who were just out having a good time, drinking, driving around, you know, speeding, um, crashed into the blacksmith shop and killed him in his sleep. Um, you know, when we had the first, we call it a next of kin meeting, when we had the first meeting with the family, we got to meet his father, who was an elderly person, and his brother, um, and his niece, and and they really impressed upon us. You know, we had to tell them what the potential 
impact of the criminal sanctions for killing somebody while drunk driving, even in the conditions that this case was in, um, are and what we expect the case to be. And just, you know, knowing that we're never going to be able to satisfy them uh, through the criminal system. I mean, it, 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 the sanctions just aren't strong enough to replace the loss of a loved one, especially around things like drunk driving. So those were those cases are always, you know, the toughest cases I think we face. Um, and so, you know, we, they're very hard to prosecute and, and they have a lot of technical aspects to them. Um, but, you know, we were able to get a successful conviction in that case against both the driver and the passenger of the vehicle. So it was, a, it, it ended up being a, a good case for the state, even though the defendant probably didn't face the penalties that he should have faced. Right. Yeah, those are, the, you know, the, the motor vehicle manslaughter cases, those are the worst it, 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 on both sides. Oftentimes, you, you obviously have a very innocent victim, but then on the other side, you have a defendant who may have no other contacts with the law. And, uh, and, and we know that the intent wasn't to kill someone, but when you drive impaired or if you're speeding or driving recklessly, then uh, we have to presume that you understand what those risks are and that you were willing to take those not only for yourself, but for everyone else on that roadway. And that judgment, that, that type of judgment is not just, you know, poor judgment. I mean, it, it is criminal negligence and we do uh, have to hold uh, those individuals accountable. But it, but it is tough, you know, it is tough. Um, the job that we do is, is really, uh, you know, it, it's not so, so always so black and white, right? And, and, and I want to talk to you a little bit even about the work that you're doing now in major crimes because uh, what we'll find is that we have uh, victims who have been victimized and very, very serious crimes, but then you have these offenders who most of them are what we call emerging adults. They're between like 18 and about 25, 26. So they're very, very young, very young, uh, and they're committing very, very violent, very serious crimes that, you know, really change in, in many ways how people feel about the communities that they live in. You know, when, when you hear about home invasions or carjackings, uh, I mean, it makes people nervous and scared. And, and so we have a role in public safety and we're going to do our jobs to keep, keep our community safe. Uh, but we're also looking across the room at someone who is basically just a kid too. So, so, so what, what judgment, what discretion uh, do you use in, in, in evaluating, you know, plea offers, or if we are, if we do win a conviction, what our sentencing recommendations will, will be? And, and what do you think that we can do a better or differently in our system uh, to, again, keep our community safe, but also uh, recognize uh, the, the youth and, and really the, the, the opportunity potentially for change for that individual uh, defendant as well. And, and that's a, a great question because it really does ask us to do what our job is. And, and what our job is, is not just to prosecute criminals, but it is to create safe, ha healthy, prosperous communities. And safe, healthy, and prosperous communities come from, you know, people feeling free to do what they need to do in order to live their lives. Um, and so, you know, with the exception of the most heinous murders or the most violent multiple rapists, you know, serial rapists, whenever we're dealing with somebody in court, they are going to come back to our community. And we have an obligation to try to get them back in a better condition than they left. Um, and so, you know, we really need, and, and so what I do is I try to put into place conditions on probation and parole that will improve their lives. So conditions like that they have to get a high school diploma or that they have to enroll in a trade school or that they have to, you know, volunteer with an organization that can help them develop skills that will help them have a uh, you know, that ray of light that allows them to uh, have hope to go forward instead of being quagmired into, you know, desperation and, and destitute. So, you know, if we, if we can, if we can, 
you know, the, the classic, you know, example is the, the carrot and the stick. Mm -hmm. Much rather use the carrot. We'd rather have people have an incentive to do things legally and, and without hurting or disrespecting the rights of others um, in order to, to be able to have a safe, healthy, prosperous community. So, Absolutely. So and, I, and I appreciate that uh, you, you do, do do that balance because it's really important um, work that, that you do and that you impart to those uh, attorneys who you lead here in the office as well. So it, it's great that you have that perspective. Um, you know, so are there any last thoughts you want to put out there, especially to those who might uh, be aspiring attorneys or hopefully some of them are interested in prosecution is are there things that they should be thinking about considering what would you say to someone who might, might be considering law so you know I, when i was you know some people who are in this job they say when they were in kindergarten they knew they wanted to be a lawyer you know that it was their natural destiny and there was nothing else that they could do I can say today that I don't think that there's another job that I would be right for more than being an attorney. Um, but I was not that person. I did not think that I was going to be a lawyer someday. Um, I decided to become a lawyer for the reasons that I think a lot of people decide to become lawyers, which is the money, you know, the, the money, the admiration, the respect. You know, I remember as a kid that if somebody was introduced to me as a lawyer, there was automatically this belief that that person is uh, smart, articulate, they have, you know, the ability to do things, um, and that they have wealth and prosperity. Um, and, and so those were things that made them uh, admirable to me. So that's why I endeavored to become a lawyer. Now, if you, the thing that they don't tell you is that the reason that lawyers are uh, wealthy is because what lawyers do is they work on the worst things that ever happened. Um, lawyers prepare people for divorce. They prepare people to face criminal charges in court after they've been uh, charged with something. Uh, we represent victims who have been victimized by other folks. Um, we help people prepare for their death and the, the, how they establish their estate uh, after they pass away. So that's what we do. That's difficult. And what I've found is that the one job in the whole lawyer realm where what you do is you try to do what's right. You're not constrained by your client's wishes to do what the client wishes to do, not necessarily what's right, is being an assistant state's attorney. We work for the public good. We get to do what's right, whether it's popular or not popular, we do what's right in cases. Um, and I think that that's, you know, it, it helps with your conscious and, and things like that when you leave work. So I, I love this job because my conscience is clear every night. That's awesome. And I, and I appreciate that. And, and, and I agree that it, it is very rewarding work. And some days, you know, the public might not like the decisions you make. Some days, the, you know, your law enforcement partners might not like the decision that you make. But ultimately, the power that this office has is um, so important that you can't be um, swayed um, by what someone likes or doesn't like. You have to do what you believe is right. And, and that's why I really love this job. And I love working with folks like you who really get it and really understand it and, and are courageous in how uh, they execute their duties and responsibilities. So thank you so thank much you. for joining me. Absolutely. So thank you so much for joining me. And um, I appreciate all of you for listening and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.